Okay, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of scene setting, I guess, for us about the general topic of internet threats. And I've subtitled it, Can We Cope? And the reason I've done so really is basically to reflect the range of things that we as general end users, and of course everybody else who goes online, finds themselves somehow faced with. And also to reflect the fact that in many cases we're actually on our own with this, or at least we need to take a significant degree of responsibility for protecting ourselves. We can't rely upon other people to do it for us, okay? So firstly then, we have a computer, or at least a keyboard and screen and a mouse here, and at the moment, um, this, this computer is quite nicely protected, and so is its end user, because this computer is switched off and it's not connected to the internet. If we were to switch it on and put it online, what sort of things do you think it and its users might be exposed to? Any thoughts? Viruses. Viruses. That's a very good answer. Anybody got any advance on viruses? Well, it's out of the world, isn't it? It's, it's there. You're connected. It is indeed. So, I mean, to be honest, it's exposed to a great deal. Can we think of any other particular keywords? So, viruses is a very good one. Scans. Scans. Malware, so malware is the generic term, malicious software. Now that will encompass viruses, worms, trojans, so I'll give you a few more. Any other? Identity theft. Identity theft, thank you, Tony. So I'll, I'll amuse you with this glorious PowerPoint animation of just as many things as I could be bothered to animate on the slide. So we've got things like viruses, worms, we've got um, Trojan horses, so that's all the malware stuff. We've got hacking, which we didn't mention, but that is something to which even end-user systems could be exposed. We've got phishing, which could lead onwards to identity theft that Tony mentioned. And we've got other things like spyware, denial of service, and spam even. So spam isn't necessarily perceived as a security threat by everybody, but in actual fact, the, the reason we receive a great deal of this comes down to compromised machines elsewhere on the network very often. So let's move on from that. Let's look just briefly at the specific issue of malware then. So we've got this, this general problem of malicious software. And to give you an indication of the scale of it, here's some information from Panda Labs, which is one of the antivirus and internet security vendors out there. Now this reflects just the first half of last year. So this was published towards the end of last year. But it reflects the first six months. And, uh, well, nigh on 12 million different malware samples new malware samples were released and identified during the first six months of last year. Now this, if nothing else, is a significant indication as to why we need to keep antivirus and internet security packages that we run on our own systems updated. So just for my interest, how many of you have antivirus on your systems? Okay, so pretty much all of you. And uh, how many of you are sure that it's regularly updated? in terms of downloading new signals. So again, not quite so many. So for those that aren't sure, the fact that there's that many new bits of malware emerging, this could be an incentive to check that your software is telling you it's got the latest signatures. Because basically, if it doesn't, then there's quite a lot of new malware to which people could end up being exposed. And again, according to Panda Labs, the overall infection rate of computers, those that they were able to scan, 39% of them were actually infected with some sort of malware. Now, the proportions of malware, what was actually there and what was responsible for these infections, it te it's tended to vary over the years. So back along, you would have found that viruses accounted for a great deal. A few years ago, we would have found that actually it was worms. Now, we're finding it's Trojans. So you can see the vast majority of infections are Trojan horses. So these are programs that claim to do something, or maybe they don't claim to do anything at all. You just don't know they're there but they're actually doing something that's unexpected on the system. So in the vast majority of these cases, the sort of things that's happening is it's opening up a back door on the system and it's giving somebody else access to that device and potentially then enabling somebody else to control the system and do something with it. So the sort of things that they might do with it are things like sending spam messages, phishing messages, performing denial of service, etc. Okay, rogueware, just to give that some definition, that is malware that claims to be antivirus software. It's claiming that it's detecting something for you. It's claiming to perform a service, but in actual fact, it's actually infecting your system further for you. 
In terms of what it's actually doing, and this is just a snapshot of April last year, again from Panda Labs, what we see here, the notable bit is that almost half of the malware is doing something about stealing data. So if we're still laboring under the, what effectively is the misapprehension that viruses, worms, etc., what they're going to do is to destroy data on your system or just print up a silly message or something, that's not what a great deal of it is now all about. What it's about is acquiring information from you, from your system, and then leveraging that for some other use. So if this is financial information, if this is personally identifiable information, it's exposing people potentially to identity theft, financial fraud, etc. Now that in turn could lead to a threat such as phishing, or indeed this could be something that occurs independently of the malware problem. So I guess, well, how much, just for, again, for my information, um, how many people in the room have encountered something of this nature? So a message claiming to be from a bank, a building society, from eBay, etc., that wants you to validate your account data, so you know, a, a fair number of people. Now, in many cases, I guess it sort of gives itself away as a scam for you because you don't happen to have an account with the provider that it's talking about. So here we have something that claims to be from Halifax, and it looks on the surface potentially genuine. It's got the logo. It's got Howard. It's always giving you extra. And in this case, if you do what it's asking, you'll certainly get a little bit extra because what it's asking you to do is to validate your account details basically by providing all of your personal information to what would turn out to be a fake site, which in turn would allow a third party to capture all of your details. Okay, so to look at the scale of the problem, based on just the first half of the last year, and this is information from APWG, which is the anti-phishing working group, which they published at the end of last year, and the full report is available free online from their website, there were just over 23,000 unique phishing messages in circulation during that period. Okay, so, uh, and this is the monthly averages, actually. So per month, an average of over 23,000 <coughs> different phishing messages. So this isn't the same thing being reported by different people. This is different phishing scams actively in operation on the net. There were almost well, over 32,500 unique phishing sites, so the sites that the messages would be directing you towards, and 327, on average, hijacked brands. So these were the brands like Halifax, for example, eBay, Amazon, etc., that the phishing messages would have been impersonating and trying to convince the recipients to respond to. Now, I say in many cases, people would have received something that seemed quite generic, dear customer, doesn't give any indication that it's really targeting you, but the sort of thing that it's asking people to do, and if it happened to arrive in the email box of somebody who actually had a Halifax account, which of course it's going to do just by chance for some people, and if the social engineering hook that it's presenting in the text was persuasive enough, then people might act in haste without really thinking about it, click through to the website, it would seem similarly dressed up to look similar to the, the legitimate site of the brand that was being impersonated and those people could pass on their information. And it, it goes back a little while now, but a statistic that I've seen quoted in the past is around 5% of recipients of phishing messages actually respond to them and provide something. So the fact that you know, many people will see this and say, this can't be for me, I don't have, in this case, a Halifax account, doesn't really matter. It's free to send the message. It can be done en masse via compromised machines in botnets, etc. And so this will yield a return for the scammer. And you can see different proportions of targeted sectors. So the majority are still focusing around gathering financial details, so impersonating banks, building societies, payment services like PayPal, etc. But also increasingly, there's, there's focus on other types of scenarios. So gaming and retail services, I think, was the most significant increase compared to the last time APWG had surveyed this. Okay, so... Just because you might receive something that doesn't claim to be from a financial service doesn't mean it's not phishing. And in some cases, things could be increasingly more personalised for reasons that we might come on to later. Now, in terms of what this means for us as users and uh, the things that we need to face, if we think about over 10 years ago now, the sort of things that might have concerned us back in the days of an operating system such as Windows ME, well, what were our main threats coming from? Well, we had 
email as a problem route. So we had viruses, worms, Trojans coming to us via email. And the advice, the standard advice then and now would be be suspicious of unsolicited email attachments from people, certainly from people that you don't know, but even from people that you know that you weren't expecting them to send you something. We had the standard problem that we still do now, of course, of system failure. And, well, at least back in around 2000, just before it, there was all that furore about the millennium bug, which, well, in reality proved not to be such a significant issue, but probably because people had prepared quite significantly in advance for it. And the sorts of things we probably would have needed to consider running on our end systems were antivirus, specifically for considering the malware threat, and to back up our data, as I'm sure we all do. Don't we? Hands up who backs up their data. Okay, well, a fair proportion of people. Good. Now, if we think about us now, okay, when I ask students how many of them back up their data, they, they, they often have their hands more relaxed at that point. Um, Main threat vectors, well, basically any internet application that we might be using. Certainly email is still a problem, but things like the social networking, certainly things through the web browser, social networks being one aspect through there, messaging, file sharing, lots of things, basically. Similarly, lots of things we need to be concerned about in terms of the technologies we ought to have running. So automatic updates, certainly making sure that our operating system and our applications are being regularly updated when the vendor releases basically a patch. So you'll notice that if you're running Windows, if you're running Mac OS, whichever the platform really, your operating system vendor occasionally will be releasing patches that are related to security. And it's important to get them installed on the systems fairly quickly, because once those are out there, it's identifying where vulnerabilities would otherwise exist within the system. And malware writers, attackers, are very quick to take advantage of vulnerabilities once they're known. So making sure you update the system, even though it can be quite inconvenient, it requires you to restart, it requires a big download, etc. And sometimes the system is not quite as stable afterwards as it was before. Um, nonetheless, it's better to try it than not. Backing up is still important. Antivirus is still there, but it's, it's basically joined by a whole range of other things that we now have under the general heading of internet security. So antivirus sort of quickly became joined by the need to have anti-spyware protection, to have a personal firewall, to have identity protection so that the system is helping you to guard against the divulgence of your personal information and intrusion prevention, so something that is guarding against somebody penetrating your system over the network. Again, if you're running vulnerable software, it's a route in for a, an attacker rather than just a bit of malware that happens to be wandering around. Okay. So the context is also changing. There's more things to be concerned about, and we're actually susceptible from more devices and more types of services. So today, how many people have a mobile device, just out of interest? Okay. How many people had a mobile device 10 years ago? Far fewer. Okay, so again, the threats can find you in that context as well. So the phishing messages, the scams, they can reach you on that device via your email in the same way that they could reach you on the desktop. There's more services that we use. How many people use social networking? Again, more than half. So that, again, is a context in which you could find yourself being targeted. And we as users become more pronounced as the focus of the attacks. Okay, so we're seen as a weak link for extracting information from, particularly in terms of our personal information. But also, if we think about people working within organisations, then going for the end user is a potential route outside the organization that they work for. So they're outside the protected perimeter that the network might provide when they're normally in the workplace. If you target them, if you target them in the right way, they can let something go that they possibly shouldn't. And in, in terms of the threats themselves, they're becoming more complex in the way that they dress themselves up. So phishing messages, I, I showed you the example there of the Halifax one, and that's just one of many. It's not that Halifax in any way is particular about being targeted more than others, but even that one was a fairly generic sort of attack. What you find now is that attackers will be prepared to do a bit of reconnaissance and to do a bit of targeted 
messaging in the case of phishing, so you get the so-called spear phishing attack. It's not then, dear customer, it's something that's far more targeted to them as an individual, or at least to them as somebody who is working within the context of a particular organisation. So we get the sort of thing, for example, here at the university, that would go after academic staff or students by dressing itself up as something that is appealing to that audience. Okay, so that basically means that the potential victims need to be far more aware. They need to be more alert to the fact that things may not always be as they seem. And there needs to be this level of understanding about, well, you know, actually, why would I be a, a, a potential target anyway? A lot of people have this, still, potentially this attitude of, well, it, it wouldn't happen to me. Why would it? Why would anybody be interested in little old me or my system? So... You know, think about what it would mean for you. So what could spyware, which intends to snoop on your activities and the things that you're doing, what could that gather from what you're actually doing? How could that harm you or your employer, etc.? If there was malware on the system, well, what could, if it was the, almost the traditional stuff that wanted to delete content, what could it do? If it was after data theft, what could it steal? And also, why would you be targeted? Why would they be targeted as, as individuals as opposed to someone else? So, you know, th there is this potential, I say, perception that there, there are big targets out there, so the people that attackers would go after, so the Microsofts or whatever that are, are there and potentially people want to target them. And of course they do, but those are also more resilient targets in many cases. And one of the things about end users and end user systems is they are less protected potentially more vulnerable, and so they are easier targets. And it depends on the attacker's motive. So, I say, it might be more convenient than a hardened corporate system. And uh, certainly, botnets so this concept of a network of compromised systems, so where malware has already taken hold, and in the background, unbeknownst to the legitimate user, this system is now doing something at the behest of an attacker, so sending out spam and phishing messages, Okay, many of these botnet participants, the, the studies have shown, so people like APWG, Symantec, etc., they've shown that actually the majority of these, at certain points in time, have been domestic systems. It's not organizations' networks that have been compromised, it's lots and lots of little guys, effectively, with their systems compromised, all contributing a bit to this problem. And the screen is off at the moment, but one of the demos that we've got running back at the back of the room later on, that will show just the effect of one compromised system okay, that's been infected um, with a worm and it's sending out information, um, it's sending out emails to other systems, and it sends a significant volume of data in just 10 minutes. And that's just one participating system. Okay, so you can have a look at that at the end. Okay, so... <laughs> Another thing about the, the current situation is people are getting more used to using online services and IT in general. It's becoming a natural part of what many people expect access to, particularly younger people. So we had many school children through here today, I had about 270 of them coming through. And you know, they're, they're naturally happy to use the technology. But perhaps, in some cases, security isn't something that uh, they've increased an awareness of, or they've got a natural awareness of, as well as just the ability to use the technology. So is security literacy keeping pace with the general use and adoption of IT? And, and possibly not, actually. It's, a, it's an area that needs a little bit more of a push to get that into the mindsets. So, basically, we've already had, it would be fair to say, several generations where security is viewed as somebody else's problem. Oh yes, well, I know security is an issue, but we have an IT administrator and that's their problem to deal with. Or, yes, I know there is a security problem on the internet, but I expect my ISP, my internet service provider, to deal with that. And I guess we know, sort of over time, that isn't realistic. There has to be some ownership by the individual, but is that message really getting through to the next generation that's coming through? And an example of where, well, over the years we've certainly seen that, that people haven't necessarily got that message is when we think of social networks. So as it says there, it's not, they're not necessarily a threat in and of themselves. It depends what we choose to put there, who we then share that with, and then, crucially, what they then choose to do with that information. But when you look at what people will happily share about themselves on social networks, many seem oblivious 
to potential risks or quite cavalier, quite carefree in terms of the information they will put up there. Not even necessarily restricting it to their friends. They will put you know, full identifiable information, dates of birth, etc., etc. You know, all the stuff that would be quite nice for an identity theft based attack quite happily out there on a social network. So the question there is, do people have an understanding of what they're doing? I think there's plenty of evidence out there that suggests no, unfortunately they don't. So certainly, as the earlier slide on what malware is going after um, would illustrate, information about us, getting, in, getting our data, it's an increasing target. But we need to try and balance this issue of what we want to share and who we want to share it with with the need to have some, well, at least awareness, at least to make an informed decision. That, do I want to make that available to that level of audience? Okay, so we certainly have opportunities to protect ourselves, but a key thing is, online services are not necessarily working in our interests. They won't make us apply the protection that we could apply. In many cases, things like Facebook and the social networks, the whole nature, the whole business model for them, if you like, is the open sharing. The more sharing that occurs, the more successful those networks will be. But that's not necessarily the same level of benefit to us. Okay? So one area in which we can achieve or not the issue of good practice is around passwords. And again, we've got some demonstration stuff that's over on the far side of the room that people can try later on, which would enable you to rate the level of password that you've got if you've not already tried it. And we had many of the, the children earlier today were going through this. They were very enthusiastic about it, it must be said. Possibly, I only say possibly, because I had sweets that I was giving to them as a thing that if they scored at least medium in the rating of their password, they would get some sweets from me. Um, but nonetheless, there were big cues. Um, passwords then. What's the problem? What do we do, or what are the, the main problems in terms of our use of passwords? Let me know. Yeah, so we use personally identifiable, potentially guessable information. What else? Same password for multiple sites. We do? Sometimes. How many people do that? Use the same password on multiple systems. And I'm not remotely surprised that people do, because it's difficult when you think of the number, the sheer number of systems and online services we now use, how could we possibly have a different password for each one and manage them properly? Okay? Or at least easily. What else? Anything else? Yeah, so we've got, we've got the problem of telling them to other people. We've got, we choose things that make it easy for us to remember. And many, in many cases, because we don't have the strategies told to us about, well, how could you remember certain things easily, then we don't necessarily choose passwords that would be difficult for somebody else to guess in the meantime. Yeah. You've also got the auto-remember option. Yes, you do. Um, so yes, the system in many cases allows us the opportunity to compromise our own security. Now this is okay perhaps if it's something locked away in your house that only you have access to, but if you've auto-remembered the password and many other people have access to that system, then that's not necessarily so safe. So let's have a look at some of the things that I put on the slide. I guess we've got several of these already. So badly so, too short. Okay, so passwords that are too short are easier to crack. Dictionary words ought to be avoided because, again, if you, you may not be aware of the way that passwords actually get cracked. It's not a question of somebody just sat there typing in different combinations. The way that it would more typically happen is somebody's acquired an encrypted copy of a password over the network, and then what happens is they're running an automated bit of software to try all the possible permutations of that until they find something that encrypts to the same value. Now, with dictionary words, the idea basically here is Many people have a tendency to use dictionary words as the basis for passwords, so use apples or something like this, unless they're advised not to. And so the password cracking tools are fairly well aware of this, so they'll maintain a pre-encrypted dictionary of those common words. Okay, so if your password is one in the dictionary, it will be cracked just like that. Okay, if it's something else, okay, if you let the system run long enough, and if your password is not complex enough, it has a chance of being cracked in a reasonable time. People use personal data. People write them down. Now, okay, this, depending on where you write them down, is more or less of a problem. I write 
a note of passwords. I have this device here that I put notes of passwords on, but I don't put what the password is. I put something that's like an aid memoir to me. So I don't think anybody else reading the little note that I've put would remotely guess, or at least I hope they wouldn't, as to what the password was. And they'd have to get to that information first anyway, because I've got a nine-digit pin protecting the phone, and they'd have to get it off me as well. And I would, you know, unless I've lost it, I defend that quite heavily. Um, but writing them down, okay, depending on how many accounts you've got, it might be useful to do so. The key thing is to write it down in some form that isn't immediately obvious to someone else, and to protect where you've written it. Infrequently changed. But of course, I know you folks, you all change your password regularly. Um, but how many of you know people who haven't changed their passwords <laughs> for the last year on some systems? Or indeed ever on some... And of course, that's going to be the case now, because you've got them on websites and all these things. And in many cases, you're forced to create accounts that you didn't really actually want, but you needed to create an account just to get access to a particular thing. And so in many cases, people will use the password that they're most familiar with, and then that perpetuates the problem, because they often have the same one on multiple systems. So if one account goes down, potentially so do others. Now, in terms of protecting yourself here, we've got a lovely little uh, color-printed leaflet. That's uh, yes, a pile of them there on the middle table, some more over on the sides. Now, that's got some advice in terms of do's or don'ts, and also some tips on passwords. So please um, take a look at that. But um, something I thought would be interesting to look at is, well, okay, one of the areas we have to have passwords on in many cases is websites. So you might expect that some of the leading websites, the things that we, you know, many of us find ourselves having accounts on, would be the vanguard of good practice, the vanguard of good practice here. So what we did, we had a look at 10 of the, the leading websites quite recently, back in the autumn of last year, looked at the well, so-called Alexa Global Top 500 websites and took entries from the top 25. Um, what we looked at was whether the site provided any guidance on choosing passwords and whether they actually restricted the password choices that people could make. So to what sense were they steering us towards good practice and in what cases were they obliging us to follow it? So the sites that I looked at here, we have some that you may recognize. So Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Wikipedia, Windows Live, Twitter, LinkedIn, Amazon, WordPress, and eBay. So different types of sites, um, sort of going all the way through the top 25, essentially. A lot of the others in the top 25, by the way, are other Google sites, for example. So Google sites for, for particular nations, so Google India, for example. Or things like YouTube, which are Google services which basically use the same login. So I used basically 10 different services that, that didn't rely on the same underlying process. So to what extent did they guide their users to do things right? And what I looked at was, to what extent did they do it when people initially signed up? And also, if people changed their passwords voluntarily later on, and if people had forgotten their passwords and needed to set a new one. And what was notable was that half the sites provided little or nothing up front during the initial registration. In many cases, it was, oh, come all ye faithful as quickly as possible. Just get yourself signed up. We'll make it as easy as possible for you to get an account so you can start doing and using whatever service we're providing. Okay, so sometimes users would receive some guidance indirectly, so they'd get some warning messages, but no explanation of why. So they might get told their password was too short or their password needed to be more complex, but no real explanation of, well, what the benefit of doing that would be. Some sites provided much more guidance when you were already an account holder and then wanted to change your password. So LinkedIn and Twitter were good examples of this at the time. So you could very easily create an account with not a particularly strong password, but at the time when you went to change it, you would get guided much better. Not necessarily that logical. And Facebook only provided advice when the user was resetting their password if they'd forgotten the original. So you might argue, OK, if they'd forgotten the original, they possibly didn't choose it that well, so you need to guide them. But why not also help them at the outset? Best examples at the time were eBay and Google, because both provided links to some fairly reasonable password selection guidance, telling you what you might want to consider in terms of selecting the password and also how to protect it once you had it. 
And also, both of them, and they weren't the only ones to do this, but they provided password strength meters, which gave you some visual indication of how well you'd selected something. OK, so that was guidance. So what did they do to enforce the restrictions? So in some cases, they might not have guided, but they might still have prevented you from choosing something that was shoddy. So what I looked at were seven different criteria as to what they could potentially enforce. So were they enforcing a minimum length? Were they preventing the user from using their surname as the password? So in many cases, of course, these sites will ask you for your name as part of the registration process. So it's something that they could guard against. Similarly, the user ID being reused. Preventing the use of the word password itself as a password. Um, because many surveys over the years, going back to the 1970s, have shown that given the free choice, Popular passwords are things like password, secret, sex, love, and things of this, and obvious keyboard combinations like 123456, QWERTY, etc., etc. And apparently, among system administrators, the password God. Um, so, so was password prevented? We tested that one. Um, did it prevent dictionary words? So I had a couple of options for dictionary words that I used there. Did it enforce password composition? So were you obliged to use a combination of uppercase, lowercase, numeric characters, etc.? And did it, when you changed or reset your password, prevent you from using ones that you'd used previously? All of these are reasonable things that could be done to try and engender good practice. So here was the overall set of results. And what we can see here is, OK, the, the most tested thing well, the most enforced thing was password length. But what we can see here is that, well, you might not be able to see because it's not that clear with white on green, um, but the, the most commonly enforced minimum length was six characters. So if you were to try on our password rating thing, six character passwords, they don't normally rate very high. Wikipedia didn't restrict the length at all. You could have a one character password on Wikipedia quite happily. You can see for most of the other things, though, these enforcements were not applied. So uh, part, preventing the use of password as a, as, a, as a choice was the next most enforced thing. So, but Amazon still didn't do it, nor did Wikipedia. Um, some of them provided password meters to help you. Some of them didn't. But even in the cases where they did provide password meters, so my name being Stephen Fennell, I thought, OK, I would test the password meters with the password Fennell1 to see how that rated. And in most of the cases where there were password meters, that was still rated strong, which I didn't think, for me, as a choice, was particularly strong. Um, and that could have been tested because many of the sites were collecting the surname as part of the registration. So what we can see here is that this isn't a particularly great score sheet for these websites. And it's things that they could, if they were keen to ensure that their users were following good practice, most of this could be quite easily tested, but isn't. OK? So there is certainly, as an observation, no standard practice for password selection, enforcement, etc., even on what could fairly well be recognized as leading sites here. And if you look at what the textbook guidance and the password policies that you often get in organizations would tell you, all of these things that I was testing, these are the standard do's and don'ts. OK? If you look at our little leaflet, those are the things it would advise. Viable checks were often excluded, so even when the site did inform you that you ought not to do this, they didn't stop you doing it. And I suppose some of the sites might say, OK, say Wikipedia, for example, where okay, you're not lodging a great deal of personal information with the site, and it's allowing you the facility basically to be an editor on content that's there. It might say, OK, you're not providing much personal information, so it's perhaps appropriate to the data that you're placing at risk for that particular site. But the thing is, in terms of helping users to learn a lesson, it's the overlooking the potential that users very often, if they use a password on one site, are going to use it elsewhere. We've established that we have that bit of culture. And there is the potential for these leading sites to help contribute to that overall culture of security awareness and good practice. And that's something they're not really doing. OK, so this is something that after, after we finish the talks, you can try for yourself on one of the machines over there. We've got our password rating system. And if uh, you don't have time this evening, it's available online via that URL. OK, so please feel free to have a play around and 
tune your password until the point where it scores strong or very strong. It's, it's quite useful. The, the, the children this morning certainly liked it, and that wasn't just because they were getting sweets out of it. We do have some sweets left if anybody would like some. Um, so, okay, so some conclusions then. So I've, I've emphasised passwords, and these, of course, aren't the, the be-all and end-all of security, but they very much are a significant lesson to learn. And certainly the experience today with some of the children that were coming through, it's a lesson that's not been uniformly learned. So some of them this morning had no particular idea. Some of them had some very good passwords that they were using, and they were typing them in, and they were scoring, actually, some very strong ratings on the system. Unfortunately, in some of the cases, they were using passwords that were 18, 19, 20-something characters in length, which is okay. I mean, they, they certainly could remember those passwords. They were providing them reliably. But many of those sites online, not only do they emphasize and enforce a minimum password length, they enforce a maximum. And so some of those passwords that the, the youngsters were using, they wouldn't actually be able to use in practice because the site would say, nope, sorry, maximum of 16, 12, whatever characters. Okay, so certainly what we have seen is bad habits can be formed early, um, and sites certainly don't force you to do it as well as you could, or as well as they could force you to do it. And there are various other lessons we need to learn. So this is just one. So we need to learn the lesson to use internet security, antivirus, personal firewall, etc., to keep our systems updated, to do the backup, which we've established you all do, so that's great. And the key thing, I guess, is be wary online, because there are threats out there, but don't be terrified, because if we do the rest of this stuff, we can operate quite happily with a, an effective level of awareness, and so can other people that we know, if they've had the advice and if they try to follow it. So you know, it's, it's no worse than anything else if you're properly prepared. That would be my message. Um, another little plug for some things that you can get for free from us. We have on iTunes U a variety of security podcasts that are downloadable. Again, there's some leaflets for that around, and that's the URL that will get you to it very easily. And other than that, um, my contact details and our research group website. I've been just, I was looking at what Steve was presenting and thinking, well, in what way does this relate to people in the room, what I'm going to say? And actually, I think it's terribly important, what I say, because I think you can get locked into the interest in how the technology works and uh, how to make the technology safe. But if you come from the other direction, from my direction, which is really social psychology, which is uh, particularly how uh, human behavior adapts to the online situation, uh, and then inside that, how we keep children safe, which is the whole um, purpose of uh, Safer Internet Day, how we keep children safe in all these um, media, then really a lot of that technology falls away. It doesn't matter. I know this is a t I'm sorry, Steve. Uh, you know, um, it's great if we can, I do believe it's great if we can teach children um, how to have safe passwords. But uh, what we know is that every time uh, a bank creates a new security vault to ensure that um, Ocean's 11 can't get to Ocean's 12 and crack open the uncrackable safe all over again, the criminal finds a way of cracking the new safe, the new de deposit box, the new uh, code or whatever. Uh, so just from that point of view, it's really difficult to say, right, if you've got Kaspersky or I've got AVG, what's AVG like, Steve? I, I was going to ask you, um, on my phone as well. Um, and if you've got this stuff, then you're safe. Well, no, if only it were that simple. And then from a social psychology point of view, the next thing becomes apparent. And that is that it's about behavior, not the technology. It's always, for us, in, in, uh, in social work, it's always about uh, children's behavior that is risk-taking to a point of vulnerability and danger, uh, rather than the, the technology. And then if you, uh, I'm sure Shirley will speak about it, but uh, Shirley's research, which, uh, where we put basic questionnaires to parents of children and to practitioners in early years settings. 
uh, and found that the majority of children under five use the internet. I think the youngest child who could get onto the internet accurately and surf effectively on a mobile phone was 22 months old. Uh, just in case you were thinking that they had to be five or six or seven to do that. Uh, this is quite groundbreaking stuff, by the way, because um, it hasn't been researched like this before. If you look at Vodafone's digital parenting magazine that you can take away with you tonight, although I'm nothing to do with Vodafone and won't make any money out of that, um, the reality is they go down to six years of age and think that they're being right on. Well, we are going down to one year of age and knowing that we're actually accurate. And then... What we have to understand and what we did with Safer Internet day to day was start to explore um, the relationship between the child and the internet in early years and recognise, what we have recognised is that just as a parent or carer has to teach a child how to cross the road safely and we can have a debate about um, at what age do you teach a child to cross the road safely? I remember having, I've had five children. You know, you have easy children and uh, normal children and then <laughs> difficult children. So my one daughter was on reins very early on and for a very long time uh, as the only safe way of getting around the house, let alone uh, onto the roadway. Uh, but in that sense, you know, we, knew, we had to really teach this headstrong individual that you stand at the curb and you look both ways and you listen and you use all your senses and you don't cross between parked cars and all this stuff. And the analogy really works in terms of how you teach children safe practice on the internet. And it does include passwords. Yeah? But it's much bigger than that, isn't it? Now, what's, what's wonderful for us is that, and I was, uh, you know, it was great having these um, nursery children in this morning to, to this room and other rooms in the university, having infant school and primary school children coming through the university this morning. It was great to watch them. I've watched them in their natural habitat, nurseries themselves, etc. too. Um, but they, what they were really interested in was just going to internet sites that their parents had said they could go to and play games. And they really weren't interested in surfing or looking around or anything like that in the main. And I'm just going to leave that with you for a minute because what we know is that behaviour changes as you get older. But I come back to the road crossing analogy which is that um, if you learn unsafe behaviours about road crossing at three they really do stay with you at 13 and at 23 and 33. You tend to drive the way you were taught to cross the road at two and three years of age. Yeah? It's, it, it's part of the whole risk-taking process. And what we've become aware of is that it's really about what you learn very early in life on the internet that stays with you in terms of your habit, your behaviour, the way you see passwords or whatever. And this is really very, very important um, to us in the professional practice of assessing children at risk. So I'm a child protection social worker. Um, I'm responsible for the, in the Plymouth Safeguard Insurance Board for ensuring that all agencies, including the university, in the city adhere to child protection procedures. Um, and then we've got a huge problem. We've got a huge problem. And that is this. Uh, that the majority, the, what we know is the vast majority of people who are responsible to children and whose job includes them, involves them in being responsible for the assessment of the, the risk to a child actually don't look at the internet. Don't consider the child's use of the internet. But there's more than that. They don't look at the family's use of the internet in assessing the risk to the child. So I go back to the road safety analogy because anybody assessing the risk to a young child in their family situation would very would always and obviously watch how a parent dealt with a child on the pavement, how it dealt with their child. And it would be a core element of assessment of how safe is that parent for that child. Did the parent recognise the, the car was coming? Did the parent line the child up with them and then march between two parked cars out into the road without looking. 
or with just sort of having a quick glance and going, did the parent wait at the, the pelican crossing for the green man or did the parent rush across on red uh, with the child because there were no cars coming at that time? Yeah? All that, the minute we see it, as assessors, we know actually this is an unsafe parent. And there's, more, there's degrees, but we know that's an indicator. Now what else is unsafe in this parenting? Yeah? And is the child safe enough? Or is the parenting too unsafe uh, to go unmodified? And what we know is adults' role, uh, role model behaviour. All children pick up role modelling behaviour. We had a very interesting statement this morning um, from someone, uh, from an adult who came in, who was saying very clearly, actually, you're doing all this with under fives, but it doesn't matter because did you know that their brain development... Um, the synapses weren't linked through neuronic passages and all the rest of it to a point where they can conceptualise adequately the links between um, um, sites on the internet and everything. So they're not in danger because they can't actually work it out. They haven't got, the brain hasn't developed enough to work it out. I know that. You're right. Yeah, we know that children until they're 9 or 10 or 11, depending on their developmental process, haven't got, haven't got abstract comprehension yet. No? But I tell you what, they can mimic. So you know that children do things, young children do things that they've seen their parents do. They don't know why they're doing them. Yeah? My, I've got a two-year-old granddaughter who says the F word. She doesn't know what it means or why she's saying it, except she's seen her daddy say it in, in anger, and she knows if she's angry, it really works to say it. She has no comprehension of what it means or what it is, yeah? but she knows it works. And that's role modelling. It's not the same. You don't have to have the, the brain construction necessary to know, oh, yes, I am now premeditatedly going to go onto a pornography website and look at adult pornography. Yeah, and I'm only three. No, no, no. But if they're around the parent in the home who is often looking at, on the, on the, the, the website, on the, on the computer screen in the living room or in the kitchen or whatever, is looking at um, porn websites and they're playing with Lego at four or five years of age in the background, yeah? Oh, well, she can't possibly understand. She can't say, anyway, my body's in the way. And, you know how canny children is? Oh, yeah, they don't listen into your conversations. Young children don't listen to, to your adult conversations, do they? Yeah, they don't look through the crack in the door to see what's going on in that room uh, when you think they're playing outside. Actually, this is very serious stuff. This is very serious stuff that we've got to take into account, and we're not. And children, young children, are using creating images, creating video, creating sound. Um, you know, young children have mobile phones, by the way, which have video cameras with sound on them now, you know, as well as old cameras and all the rest of it. They know how to use laptops. What have we, we've got preschool... Um, uh, no, we had, this morning, children coming from what, what you would call in the European style kindergarten, but actually Plymouth College has... Um, a preparatory years, yeah, and we had them all in little uniforms, three, four years of age, yeah, some of them with Apple iPads. Yeah? <laughs> there are schools in America, kindergartens in America, where you are not admitted unless you have, your, your parent supplies you with an iPad, because that's how you learn now. No pens and paper and all the rest of it, you will Wi-Fi, Apple, iPad, learn. Pre-5. Yeah, so, the, the, welcome to the future here. And we've got to get uh, clear about what needs to be done uh, to protect the early years. In the recognition that the behaviour that you learn in the early years becomes habit. Becomes what some people talk about as instinctive. Yeah? It's just learnt repetitious instinctive behaviour which lasts through your lifetime. These are the formative years. These are the formative years, not seven, eight, nine, ten, two, three, four. And this is really very important for us. And then, 
we need to, I need to put it into the professional construct because the only way that any professional working with a child assesses a child, the risk to a child and the child's needs is by the shared concept of what a child is. And we call it the triangle. Some of you here won't have seen it, but everybody in the technology world needs to know this. The triangle is that the, human, the child is at the centre of our focus. The child is a three-dimensional human being, not, a, not an object to be done to, but a subject to be dealt with. You know, negotiated with, understood, and all the rest of it. And you can define, and we all, whether we're probation officers, or social workers, or teachers, or early years practitioners, um, whatever, whatever role we have around in the team around the child, we all have the same, under, the same language and understanding of what a child is. And a child can be described in total, at any age, by the sum total of their developmental needs at the age they are, the parenting capacity around the child and the wider social influences upon that child. You can't describe a child unless it, it, accurately unless you've got three sides of the triangle. And you can knock those down into subheadings in terms of some of the obvious um, elements that you must look at. The health of the child, how the child sees themselves uh, at any one age, etc. Now, if I had time, I haven't got time, so I'm not going to go into it now, but you need to think about this. If I look at community resources, but I don't look at our internet access, all the technocrats in the room will say, well, don't you understand that the internet is central to a child's life today? And yet the vast majority of assessments I see on children don't look at the child's interface with the internet. If I look at the child's identity today, from two, maybe one, onwards, the internet influences and impacts on how the child sees themselves and how the child is seen. You remember the camera here? The video, etc. If I look at parenting capacity, how much is the internet in the house a babysitter like the DVD was five years ago, rather than there being human interaction between the parents and the child? This is absolutely key. This is fundamental stuff, isn't it? And yet, I have to tell you, that the vast majority of those who are employed to assess risks and needs of children don't think of the internet interface on any of that. Yeah? And my job is actually <laughs> to try and force them to do so, so you can see how fa what a failure I feel in terms of us not getting any practitioners here tonight because this was just one more forum in which hope we, we hoped we could get some practitioners to listen to this. Family history and functioning. We know from Ofcom 2010 that 40% of men in uh, the UK admit to using pornography on the internet. It's about 25, 30, 28% of women, adults. Yeah? It's normal, in other words. Yeah? But what is going on in the household around pornography that involves the child in pornography? And then the debate down the road, which you've chosen not to go to, is about what is the influence of um, the, the growth in massive imagery, video and sound imagery, of adult sex. What impact is that having on the child uh, when they come into contact with it? You know, to what point does it come into the home? Now, this isn't me being moralistic or scaremongering. This is about there is a debate going on as to how it is influencing changing uh, behaviours in particularly pubescent children around their, their adoption of sex uh, and, and relation to it and relation to each other as a consequence. And, you know, there are, sorry, there are lecturers, not here tonight as I, as I understand it, but there are lecturers who are saying at Plymouth University, all oh, this is scaremongering about pornography, I'm quite resilient, you know, you can see a man's willy and it just laugh at it, Children do, they're not, they're not bothered by it and all the rest of it. Yeah, it, it, it's okay. No, actually it's not quite okay because for 80%, what we know is for about 80% of the pubescent adolescent starting to explore their sexuality, starting to engage in sexual activity to find out what it's about, what's nice, what's not nice, what they want to do, what they don't want to do, they're fine. But what in social work we've known 
for generations across the world is that there's something called the vulnerable child. It's about one in five. They are children with maybe learning difficulties. Not, some, not as acute as learning disabilities, but learning difficulties. They're children who have not um, really bonded with their parents particularly well. So a third of, the, of, of children actually have insecure attachment, as it's called. It's, a, it's a, another you know, psychological understanding. But the insecure attachment means that they are um, looking more for something outside of their parents, for security, for emotional foundation, for base. Yeah, the par parenting isn't enough for them, and therefore they look elsewhere, and therefore they're more emotionally vulnerable. Yeah? Uh, we, I could go on and on about this, but actually you start to get it quite quickly that um, whilst the, the majority of, teen, of young teenagers are very resilient to some of what seems to be quite threatening um, imagery uh, and behaviours that they see on the internet, the classic minority, the traditional minority of children who have always been the vulnerable child, are vulnerable online. And what we know from research is that actually they're more vulnerable online. That uh, it's more toxic. Yeah? It's, it's more disconcerting. That if I am emotionally young for my age, everyone knows what that sort of person, you've come across people who are emotionally young for their age, yeah? uh, that in my peer group I'm going to be more vulnerable by what's being laughed at by the majority, but what to me is, I don't get this, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Yeah? What, what constitutes rape? Can I say no to what I'm just seeing on the internet all the time? So the vulnerable teenager is extremely, is made more vulnerable on the internet. And, you know, we bang on about pornography all the time, sorry about the pun, but, you know, that's just one of the issues. So what we've got, what we're starting to look at, is family role modelling in early life. What, what does you, do young children come across as a result, not simply of their parents' behaviour online, but their siblings' behaviour on the line, or their cousins, their you know, relatives that come in and out of the house. And how does that impact on what the young child thinks is normal? And look at the threats. You know, 95% of, of, of activity on the internet is very safe, although much of it is extraordinarily boring. Those of you who are on Facebook, oh, hello, you know, I am, but it gets a bit yawny, doesn't it, you know? Um, but the threat of bullying is such on the internet that whilst it was first stated in law as a threat in uh, 1991, internet bullying, you know, actually by 2004 it, it went into the definition of child abuse in terms of significant bullying, the vast majority of which we know now happens on the internet. You know? Compared to how is that bullying done, well most of it is having a go at you because of your sexuality, you're gay, 12 years old, in the canteen, yeah, you run out crying, you hide under the bedclothes, you're not going to go to school anymore, uh, you're black. So we know homophobia and racism are the chosen majority forms of discrimination uh, in the young teen. Uh, that, that is used as the mechanism in bullying online, etc. Then we've got the tracking and the threats uh, that go with it, and therefore the need for your, you know, keeping your identity safe. There's the sexual images and activities, but there's also gambling and buying online. So we know that there's the case of the, there's the Sun newspaper case, but it is actually real. They usually lie about whatever they put in the newspaper, but it's real that. Um, you know, mum had stored her internet card details on her mobile phone and her three-year-old had gone on her phone and put in, written in tractor, no, seen a picture of a tractor and pressed it and got onto a website and placed an order with a down deposit for a tractor. I don't mean Playmobil, I mean a real industrial tractor. Yeah? Um, 
so that's there. So parents need to think about, ooh, you know, am I keeping my... You know, can, can somebody else than me buy anything online on the mobile phone? But the, 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 the truth of the matter is huge numbers of parents are sat with their laptop, with the kid watching television, with them playing poker on the settee. Vast numbers. Vast numbers. You know? The kid at three or four is learning gambling. Is normal. Is what you should do. It's exciting. It's like, yeah! What's, why, why is mum so fed up tonight? Why is she angry, dad? Yeah? Oh, she's just lost another 20 pounds on the bingo. It's been sat on the laptop doing it, but what... But the, culturally, what is the child growing up with here? And then, of course, we know the shift. You know, why are all the shops shutting down? Because everybody's buying online. Where is the debt coming from? You buy on a plastic card. Yeah? So there's a real interface between people getting into more and more credit debt and buying online. Children are learning that you buy things online and that it's not real money. You don't have to have money to buy it. Yeah? And uh, the, all these things are, are real problems, worries for us. So, but then at the hard end, the child protection end, we have all the issues of in understanding the interface between the family and the internet and what that says about per parent incapacity, what it says about the emotional health of the child and the family, what it says about age-appropriate child development, and when I mean age-appropriate, I mean to what extent is the child's development being distorted by the internet, yeah? um, and particularly emotionally distorted, cultural identity, as I've talked about, and then lastly, exploitation. Exploitation by um, companies, corporations that just want you want to sell and want you to buy, so we know Facebook takes your profile and has a right-hand column in the Facebook account that is just targeted adverts at you because of what you've written about on Facebook in the past. I keep getting stuff about Bob Dylan. I happened to put Bob Dylan in years ago. I haven't listened to him for a very long time, but they keep wanting me to buy the T-shirt. All this, this sort of stuff. So, but, and so we always think of sexual exploitation, but actually it's commercial exploitation of children is absolutely rampant, and how do the parents actually protect? So the message from tonight for me is simply traditionally vulnerable children are more vulnerable children online, and somehow all those involved in community assessment of children who they can have concerns about need to really get it, and it would help us in the child protection industry a lot if the technical industry actually understood a bit more about that psychosocial uh, interface with the internet. I hope that's useful to you.